Today we're diving into Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Yeah. Um, it's a condition that can look a lot like a heart attack. Absolutely. Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, it's fascinating, really highlights that mind-body connection. It really does. So let's start with the basics. Can you break down what Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is and what makes it different from a typical heart attack? Sure. Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, it's sometimes called broken heart syndrome. Mm -hmm. It's a temporary condition um, where the heart muscle weakens, primarily in the left ventricle. This weakening, it impairs the heart's ability to pump blood effectively. Now, the key difference here from a heart attack. In Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, there's no blockage in those coronary arteries. Oh, interesting. So the heart muscle dysfunction, it's not caused by a lack of blood flow. So if it's not a blocked artery, what causes that sudden weakening of the heart muscle? That's where that mind-body connection really comes in. The leading theory is it's triggered by this surge of stress hormones, like adrenaline, often released during periods of intense emotional or physical stress. And these hormones, they seem to temporarily stun the heart muscle, yeah. leading to that uh, characteristic apical ballooning. Yeah, that apical ballooning is pretty striking. It really does resemble a Japanese octopus trap, the Takotsubo. Exactly, and that distinctive shape. It's a key feature, helps us differentiate it from other heart conditions. You mentioned emotional or physical stress can trigger this hormone surge. Can you give some specific examples of what might trigger Takotsubo cardiomyopathy? Certainly. Emotional triggers, they can range from the death of a loved one, a sudden bad news, to uh, even, you know, an intense argument or even a joyous event like a surprise party. Wow, so really anything. Right, exactly. On the physical side, triggers can include things like surgery, a severe illness, a major accident. And it's important to note, in some cases, no clear trigger can be identified. Interesting. So it's not always a straightforward cause and effect. Precisely. The interplay of factors, it can be pretty complex. If a patient comes in with symptoms that could indicate either a heart attack or Takotsudo cardiomyopathy, how do we tell the difference? What are those key diagnostic criteria? That's a crucial question, because timely and accurate diagnosis, that's essential for guiding treatment. First, we need to rule out a heart attack definitively. This involves a thorough medical history, an electrocardiogram, ECG, blood tests to check for those elevated cardiac enzymes. And importantly, coronary angiography. This will reveal no significant blockages in the coronary arteries in patients with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. So that absence of coronary blockages, that's a strong indicator that we might be looking at Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. It's a critical piece of the puzzle. In addition to that lack of blockages, we look for specific patterns on the ECG, like ST segment elevation and characteristic wall motion abnormalities in the left ventricle during an echocardiogram, particularly that, uh, that apical ballooning. Those diagnostic tools are essential in differentiating Takotsubo cardiomyopathy from other conditions. But I imagine there are other heart conditions that could present with similar symptoms. How do we make sure we're not missing anything else? You're absolutely right. We have to be very vigilant about ruling out other possibilities. For example, myocarditis and inflammation of the heart muscle, it can also present with chest pain and ECG changes. We also need to exclude pheochromocytoma, a rare tumor that can cause a surge in adrenaline. These conditions require specific tests for diagnosis. So it sounds like a careful and comprehensive approach is really needed to get to that accurate diagnosis. Exactly. It's a process of elimination and uh, careful consideration of all the clinical findings. Now, let's talk about who is most affected by this condition. Are there certain groups that are more susceptible to Takotsubo cardiomyopathy? Yes. While Takotsubo cardiomyopathy can affect anyone, it's significantly more common in women, particularly postmenopausal women. In fact, women account for roughly 90% of reported cases. 90%? That's a striking difference. It is. And while we don't fully understand why women are so much more susceptible, there are some theories. One prominent theory focuses on the role of estrogen. Right, we talked about estrogen's potential protective effect on the heart earlier. Exactly. Several other factors can increase an individual's risk. A history of anxiety or mood disorders, like depression, seems to make individuals more susceptible. Certain neurological conditions, such as seizures or strokes, have also been linked to an increased risk. Additionally, any condition that causes a significant release of stress hormones like hyperthyroidism or pheochromocytoma can potentially trigger Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. So we've covered the basics and risk factors of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. But what happens when a patient is diagnosed with this condition? What does treatment actually involve and what can they expect in terms of recovery? 
Well, the good news is, treatment for Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is often supportive, focusing on managing symptoms and giving the heart that chance to recover. Okay, so what specific steps are taken to um, help the heart recover? Initially, the approach is similar to um, a suspected heart attack. We want to stabilize the patient, address those immediate concerns. This could involve oxygen therapy, aspirin, medications to manage blood pressure and heart rhythm. But once Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is confirmed, the treatment strategy shifts. So once the diagnosis is clear, how does the treatment plan change? We often use medications like beta blockers. They help reduce the effects of those stress hormones we talked about. Beta blockers essentially uh, dampen the heart's response to adrenaline and noradrenaline, allowing it to rest and recover. So we're basically calming the heart down, giving it a break to heal. Exactly. And alongside beta blockers, we might prescribe ACE inhibitors or ARBs. These medications help improve the heart's overall pumping function, supporting its recovery. And those medications are used for other heart conditions too, right? That's right. They're valuable tools, you know, for a range of heart-related issues. Now, depending on the individual case, anticoagulants might also be prescribed. This helps prevent blood clots from forming in that weakened heart, reducing the risk of complications. It sounds like a multifaceted approach, really tailored to each patient. Precisely. We carefully consider their overall health, their symptoms, the severity of their Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, and we create that individualized treatment plan. You mentioned earlier that the prognosis for Takotsubo cardiomyopathy is often positive. What can patients expect in terms of recovery time and uh, long-term outcomes? This is where things get really encouraging. The vast majority of patients with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy make a full recovery within a few weeks or months. Heart function returns to normal and they can often resume their regular activities, you know, no limitations. Wow, that's incredible. But it's important to emphasize that complications are relatively rare. In some cases, patients might experience heart failure where the heart struggles to pump blood effectively. Others might develop arrhythmias. Now, for patients who have recovered from Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, is there a risk of it happening again? Is that something they need to worry about long-term? Recurrence is possible, but thankfully it's not very common. Study suggested occurs in about 10% of patients. 10%? Okay. Are there any specific factors that might increase the risk of recurrence? While the exact triggers for recurrence aren't fully understood, ongoing stress and underlying health conditions seem to play a role. We also know that patients who experience a particularly severe episode of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy might be at a slightly higher risk of recurrence. So stress management and just overall health maintenance are really important, even after recovery. Absolutely. We encourage patients to prioritize stress-reducing activities. Things like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, spending time in nature, maintaining a healthy lifestyle with regular exercise, a mm. balanced diet, adequate sleep. It's all crucial. It's about building that resilience physically and emotionally. Exactly. Empowering patients to take an active role in their long-term heart health and well-being. What are some key takeaways you want our listeners, especially other healthcare providers, to remember? Well, first, I want to say again that Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, even though it can be scary, is treatable and usually temporary. Most patients recover fully. Understanding this can really bring hope to both patients and providers. And second, it's important to remember that Takotsubo cardiomyopathy isn't just a broken heart. It's this complex mix of physical and emotional factors, and our care needs to reflect that. Addressing the psychological impact is just as important as managing the physical symptoms. But on that note, We'll wrap up our deep dive for today. Thank you for joining us on this journey. We hope you've gained valuable insights that you can use in your practice. Until next time, stay curious, stay informed, and keep those hearts healthy. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, Feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.